the president said they're all accounted for. They're We've all got them all. They're all coming home, and then there were subsequent statements that suggested they were all home and that the others were dead. Okay. So somebody knew that what the president said was wrong. And what, what, what happened? What, what did that person well, do? Well, so far, what we've been able to discern, and we have more testimony that will be forthcoming on this, there was just a, an unwillingness to confront it. There was a failure of moral commitment and of fundamental leadership on this issue. There's no other way to characterize it. Uh, and it is possible that someone made a conscious decision. We don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, to move in a different direction, to just say, look, we can't deal with that now, and to move on. Mm -hmm. Now, I you mean, certainly that indication, Morton, comes through in the comments of Roger Shields regarding what his is. boss... Roger Shields was at that time a political appointee in the Nixon administration in the Defense Department in charge of POW affairs. He reported directly to uh, Bill Clements, who subsequently became the governor of Texas, who at that time was in the Defense Department and was his immediate superior, I think Deputy Secretary or Undersecretary. Uh, Bill Clements was quoted by Roger Shields as saying to him, they're all dead. Roger Shields said to Bill Clements, you can't say that. To which Bill Clements responded, you didn't hear me correctly. I said, they're all dead. Now that has been sworn to under oath, testified to publicly, as well as in sworn deposition. Mm -hmm. And it is something that we have heard from a number of different sources other than just Roger Shields. Well, the, the latest big wrinkle in this is, of course, the statement by uh, Boris Yeltsin that uh, some Vietnam POWs may have been taken to, uh, to the Soviet Union. Now, the president sent Malcolm Toon, former U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, over there, and he says he can't find any evidence. What, do you think that this has been adequately investigated? Not yet. I think there's more that can be done on it, and our committee is engaged in some of that more. Uh, I really do not think uh, a matter of a week and a half or two weeks with uh, us dependent on certain individuals to produce some records is a complete examination of it. Uh, there are more people to be talked to. There is a broader net to be cast. Uh, that doesn't mean that his conclusion is going to be ultimately wrong. It simply means that I think there's more inquiry that is necessary. Uh, but I'm not convinced, personally, that Boris Yeltsin was accurate in referring to Vietnam. We certainly have no first-hand evidence at this point in time that shows us that anyone from Vietnam was positively uh, transferred. There's some evidence to indicate they might have been, and that needs to be followed up on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm not saying to you there isn't some capacity for this to be true. Now, y you say that, uh, that you can't at this point uh, blame people, but uh, the, the, the term cover-up, I believe, has been used by Ross Perot, uh, who's running for president, or uh, may about to be running for president. <laughs> and uh, uh, Ross Perot claims that there were American POWs left alive, he believes, in Laos, and that one administration after another um, ignored the fact and, and did less than all it could to get those people back. Well, I think what do you think of those charges? I, I think it's not uh, wholly inaccurate at all. I mean, I personally believe that the likelihood is that some of those people were alive. That's the conclusion I draw based on the evidence that I have seen so far. I can't tell you, yes, they absolutely were, but I believe they were, based on the evidence that I have seen, at least some of them. Uh, and I agree with Raspero that administrations did not do all that needed to be done, witness the fact that 20 years later, we are doing it. Witness the fact that it is only 20 years later that we have had a grouping of evidence and even admissions under some pressure of certain individuals that there were indications that people were alive back in 1973. So if you're admitting that in 1992, and we have this entire apparatus set up as we do in 1992 to try to get the answers to these discrepancy cases as they're known, you must ask yourself, what was the status of those cases in 1973 and what was the evidence in 1973? I think that evidence needs to come out and people will make their own judgments. Now, 
Perot was supposed to testify before the committee, the full committee, and then he backed out and, and right. said that he was afraid that this was going to be a, a, another uh, Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas confrontation. Uh, are you are you a, a hostile well, look, interrogator of him? Let me just what? tell you something. Yeah. If it, if it was going to be another Anita Hill, that's a very bad analogy uh, to use because if it was another Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas situation, Congress loses, not Ross Perot. So for him to express concern about Congress being made to look like an ass is a very silly reason to say I'm not going to come. I, I don't buy that. If we were to be hostile, and if we were to gang up on him, I guarantee you, we would be the losers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know one member of our committee who didn't understand and, and even fear the implications of Mr. Perot sitting in front of us, like another Oliver North, being able just to command the scene and do things. So, I mean, this was his forum, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised he didn't uh, take advantage of it. Uh, we are proceeding as we are now, they put him on record in, I think, a dignified and appropriate way. The committee has not waived any right to have him come in the future if we think it will add to our ability to get information. But uh, clearly, I didn't want this process politicized. I didn't want us to be put in the position of having everybody feel that we're, we're ambushing a presidential candidate. And uh, so we made some judgments, and I think they're the right judgments, and I think we're proceeding in the right way. What conclusions about Ross Perot do you draw from what he's said about all this? Well, I don't draw many yet because I haven't read the full measure of his testimony. Um, I certainly have an impression, and not a full conclusion, that Ross Perot was caring about an important issue, that Ross Perot uh, had a sense that something was wrong, he was engaged in the issue, and that he, uh, in legitimate form, pressed that part of the issue. I am not yet uh, persuaded that there wasn't uh, some hyperbole or exaggeration to some of the uh, claims made at some subsequent points, but I can't measure that, obviously, until I see what it was based on. And I think we need to make that kind of judgment. It is alleged by administration officials that when Perot made various trips to North Vietnam or had uh, intermediaries go to Vietnam, th uh, that he was less tough on the North Vietnamese than the Reagan administration wanted to be um, and, was, and was making offers to them to get POW MIA information that the, that the administration would not, would not make. And also there are allegations that he was doing this for commercial reasons, that he wanted to develop business ties to Vietnam. Do you have any information about that? We do, but I really can't talk about it at this point until he's had an opportunity to answer some of the questions we have about it with the, with the deposition process and until some documents have been produced to the committee. But it is a legitimate area of inquiry and we're going into every single part of that. I might just add, parenthetically, it doesn't hurt you to have a good cop, bad cop on the scene, as you know. Uh, it helps you get some information sometimes, so I'm not sure it was altogether unproductive that he was you know, trying to bring them along on a different road. Uh, uh, but we need, we need to lay all of that out. Mm -hmm. You know, the difficulty here is, and I said this in our hearing last week, you can't tell this story in the course of two days of hearings. Uh, we have a great deal more work to do. We have established a threshold, I think, and we've narrowed the universe that we're dealing with. We've had a lot of truth come out. I mean, we know we're not dealing with 2,266 POWs and MIAs. We've had an admission that fully half of those, probably, can be absolutely accounted for as having been killed in action, but they're not recoverable. So that brings your universe down. In addition to that, we've shown that taking every list you can lay your hands on, and by pulling lists together that in 20 years have never been pulled together, we've come up with a universe of people that is not that far off from the universe of people that General Vesey is dealing with. Now, all of this will be laid out for the public to see. Any conspiracy, conspiracy theorist out there who says this is the grand cover-up will have an opportunity to see every one of these lists. If they can produce the name, if they can produce another family that can come forward and say, my son's not on that list, my father's not on the list, let them do so. But absent that, 
we will finally be dealing with a real list of who might have been left behind, of who came home, of who died and is not recoverable, and hopefully America can come to grips with these 133, 110, 80, whatever it is, and hopefully we will get answers from the Vietnamese about what happened to them. Now, some of those answers have already been forthcoming. 54 or more remains of those 80 have been returned to us. So we know already that they aren't alive today, that grouping. That brings the possibilities down. None of this has ever happened in 20 years, which is astonishing to me. What's your uh, hunch? Do you think anybody's alive yet? You know, that is a dangerous uh, speculation at this point. I, I will tell you, and I have said this publicly before, it is possible someone is alive. It is certainly possible someone is living somewhere not in captivity. It is possible they're in captivity of people outside of the control of government. It is very difficult for me to find any rationale whatsoever for a government that for 20 years has denied its holding people, for a government that has refused offers of money or cutting deals, to have any rationale at all for holding somebody alive in secret I mean, you just have to say to yourself, for what purpose? So they could get caught with their hands, you know, dirty and, and, and ruin everything that they want in terms of relationship and future? I find that hard to believe. So I think when you really deal with probabilities here, as we ought to, honestly and candidly, uh, we're going to have a much narrower group of people than some have thought. We need to be mad, but we also need to make the right decision, and that's what I'm offering. What type of foreign policy would Bill Clinton advance if elected president? The Arkansas governor supported the Bush administration's decision to go to war in Iraq and has criticized George Bush for reacting too slowly to the civil war in Yugoslavia. He advocates the use of U.S. troops as part of a multilateral effort to open up the airport at Sarajevo and says he would use military force to do so. He also criticizes the Bush administration for foot-dragging on aid to Russian and other former Soviet republics at a critical juncture in their movement toward democracy. The president's aid package is currently mired in political wrangling on Capitol Hill. At the top of Clinton's foreign policy agenda is improved ties with Japan, a country Clinton calls America's most important partner in the New World Order. Foreign way. policy has long been considered George That's Bush's high outside. card when it comes to presidential politics. This year, can an Arkansas governor with virtually no foreign policy experience convince voters he should replace George Bush as the leader of the world's only remaining superpower? Senator Kerry, let me turn to Yugoslavia. Uh, the violence continues in Sarajevo. UN soldiers have even been uh, slightly injured. Is it time to commit United States forces to help out there? I, I don't think you can commit United States forces without a European commitment of leadership first. I would be absolutely prepared to place United States forces as part of a European uh, security community effort uh, to try to resolve this problem. But if the Europeans cannot understand their uh, imperatives in stopping this violence and in trying to prevent a repeat really almost of the early part of this century, uh, we're not going to be able to force it on them or to force a peace in the region and we should not uh, unilaterally engage in that. On the other hand, we could offer, I think, greater leadership than we have in the effort to send the right messages and to help bring the multilateral force together that is necessary to do it. Nothing short of that will deal with a thug like Milosevic and what is happening in that region. And the world, if there truly is a new world order, uh, ought to raise this to a higher level of uh, imperative. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's similar to what uh, Governor Clinton has said, the presumptive nominee of your party, um, yet well, you similar to what Dick Lugar has said, uh, too, former chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and a Republican. Right, but w one difference is that uh, that you and, and a lot of other Democrats voted against the Gulf War 
now yeah, now you're be, interested in going in not, going to no, there's uh, no difference at all yeah, not one me. iota yeah. more. And in fact if you go back and read the speech i gave on the senate floor i was adamant in stating that we ought to remove saddam hussein from kuwait and that if it took force we should use force my difference was as to whether or not we had reached the point where you commit another generation of americans without having an end game that was well thought out without knowing exactly what we were going to do in the long run in this situation and whether we had exhausted the possibilities of doing it without putting people in harm's way i was a hundred percent prepared to put people in harm's way if we had reached that uh, point but as a vietnam veteran particularly i felt that we had not exhausted all of those possibilities and i thought the risks before we do another thing to another generation ought to do it now the president I also said very clearly at the time that this was going to be fundamentally easy. It would not be another Vietnam, and that uh, victory was not the issue here. The issue here was when you do it. Uh, so there's no difference at all in my policy whatsoever. Um, and I think, indeed, history has supported what I said. Saddam Hussein is still in power. We reneged on the Kurds and the Shiites. Our behavior was reprehensible. We have a dictatorship sitting in Kuwait, and none of the reforms that were promised came through, and we never elicited the full measure of support for the peace process in the Middle East ahead of time that we should have. That's what I meant by thinking it out and by knowing what the end game was. What people will say is, what is the American interest here? Why is this a vital thing for us to be doing? It's the same kind of interest we have always expressed around uh, the world in terms of having stability, having freedom, democracies, people able to make choices for themselves. I think the, the, the distinguishing factor between the Vietnams and the Philippines of the world and other kinds of situations we've gotten into is whether or not people want to uh, fight for themselves, whether or not they're really prepared to, uh, whether it's us that's doing it or whether it's us helping them do it. In this case, I think there is a clear them that wants help in doing it and I think it is appropriate for the United States of America uh, to assist people to do that. That's, after all, what we struggled to have happen in the so former Soviet Union. It's who we are and what we're about, and the world is better off when people have freedom and, and capacity to choose and democracy and so forth. We mm -hmm. can't always win those battles. We certainly won't win them when we're trying to impose it ourselves, as we learned in Vietnam. Clinton has accused President Bush of foot dragging on aid to Russia and the other former Soviet republics. Um, yet the Republicans blame Congress. Uh, um, who is to blame? I think there's a combination there. Congress uh, has been, there's been a reluctance in the part of the Congress to deal with the issue, partly though because the President hasn't sold the issue to America. So it's a combination of factors. How do you stand on it? I am in favor of it. I think it is absolutely essential that America help uh, this former adversary and these real Democrats. Yeltsin is a real Democrat, little d. And for us to not invest a couple of billion bucks, uh, to not spend 300 billion bucks would be absolutely absurd. Moreover, most of this package is in the form of assistance to our own people. It brings college students to America to study. It helps our farmers with credits. Uh, it will create jobs uh, in this country, our country. It will put our people to work selling products uh, to them. Uh, I just think it's very, very sensible. And we mustn't, you know, shut our eyes to uh, the realities of this world. If we want to go back to have those in the Soviet, former Soviet Union who would love to go back to the old order, suppress Latvia and the Baltics again, uh, take the Crimea back, uh, subjugate whole states, stir up the world, uh, and spread uh, whatever form of authoritarianism they would spread, even though it might not be communism, uh, we would be losing the moment of a lifetime uh, to really have a new world order. And I think a one and a half billion dollar to whatever expenditure to do that, given all the pluses to us, and to avoid spending $300 billion on things that America does not need or want except to preserve its security uh, would just be a loss of an extraordinary moment. The politics of it are tough. Senator Kerry, thanks very much for being with us. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. For American Interests, I'm Morton Kondracki. Well,
Okay. Uh, they worried, yeah, they worried about the time. Next week, public television teams up with NBC News to bring you the proceedings of the Democratic National Convention. Tune into Iowa Public Television and join Jim Lehrer, Robert McNeil, and Tom Brokaw for live coverage. That's next Monday through Thursday, 7 to 10. All the challenges have been met. The enemy is not beaten, but he knows that he has met his master in the field. This program was produced by the Blackwell Corporation, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for American interests is provided by Maytag Corporation, a family of companies continuing the quality tradition in home appliances and vending products throughout the world. For a video cassette of American interests,